Well, welcome to Gospel Issues with Christian Concern. It's great to have you with us. And the topic today is why bother with biblical law? A question that a lot of people, a lot of Christians ask, and it's very topical and relevant. And who better to talk about it than Professor Jonathan Burnside, Professor of Biblical Law, no less. What better person could we have? So we're going to go and play a pre-recorded video of him uh, talking about this. And then in about 30, 40 minutes, uh, 35, 40 minutes or so, we will come on to a Q&A and discussion uh, joined live with Jonathan Burnside and also Andrea Williams. Um, if, you, if you're watching live, do put in your comments and questions on Facebook or YouTube. We can see them and we will try and get to as many as we can. And uh, But in the meanwhile, enjoy Jonathan's talk on the subject of why bother with biblical law. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Jonathan Burnside and I'm here to talk to you about the subject about biblical law and why we should bother about biblical law. Um, first of all, I should perhaps say what I mean by biblical law. Obviously, I'm, I'm capturing here uh, the uh, laws, what we would conventionally regard as laws, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, most especially found in the Pentateuch. But I think by biblical law more broadly as an, an integration of different instructional genres in the Bible. Uh, that includes things like proverbs, uh, narrative, um, poetry, song, the Psalms, uh, and all of which are instructional genres in different ways, uh, and which shouldn't really be played off uh, against things which we might conventionally regard as, as more legal parts of the Bible. But how all of these instructional genres together um, present a picture of a society that is accountable to God. And in fact, uh, the ways in which uh, biblical law, broadly understood, uh, have um, impacted upon Western civilization being um, very profound. Um, even if we just look at our own country in the um, United Kingdom or in England, uh, we can uh, trace a pattern uh, going all the way back to people like King Alfred the Great, uh, who presented the first uh, codified uh, laws uh, of England, uh, structured around and uh, based around uh, the Covenant Code in the Book of Exodus. Uh, and that's a pattern which is which has um, been reaffirmed uh, and built upon in the century since, and that'll be another whole talk. Uh, another time. Um, and really, because biblical law has been so profound uh, in terms of shaping our understanding uh, of what it means to live in an orderly and just society, it's not really surprising uh, that many people have, um, in more recent centuries, um, been very focused on wanting to undermine uh, the role of biblical law. Uh, so if we uh, look at um, the uh, development of some of the um, uh, early sort of source critical approaches to the Bible in uh, German uh, uh, faculties of theology in the um, uh, 19th century, for example, uh, we find that they were very focused uh, on uh, the Pentateuch, Genesis, uh, and on, on biblical law, because if you can remove those foundations, uh, well, then you haven't really got um, uh, uh, an origins, you haven't got a creator God, um, you haven't really got uh, a nation of Israel. Um, you haven't really got any expectations of a Messiah either. Uh, and you can really undermine uh, the idea of uh, what counts as a stable society or just society and construct your own uh, conceptions instead. So there's quite a lot riding on the subject of biblical law and why we should take it seriously. Um, but the question, I'm afraid, of why should we bother with biblical law is uh, for many of us. Uh, in our churches, not all to be uh, to be fair, but for many of us it is a rhetorical question. Um, it doesn't really need an obvious, uh, it doesn't really need an answer because it's obvious. Why should we bother about biblical law? Well, we shouldn't because it doesn't matter anymore, we say, uh, now that Jesus is here. And so we tend to say things like, well, the law reveals the character of God, um, which we now see um, uh, displayed um, uh, most fully, uh, in the uh, the person of, of Jesus Christ, so really why should we bother? Um, biblical law is a dead letter, uh, a closed book, and frankly irrelevant. But in fact, there are all sorts of reasons in the New Testament as to why we should take biblical law seriously, uh, and I'd like to go through some of these uh, justifications uh, with you in this session. 
Um, the first thing I'd like to say is that um, Jesus took Torah seriously and he expects us to as well. It seems to me that uh, the place to start is to look at how Jesus treats scripture. It seems fairly self-evident to me that if we're Christians we must treat scripture as, as Jesus treats scripture and when we know how he treats it then that must be the paradigm for how we are to treat it also. And there is no question that Jesus treats all of the scriptures, including the Pentateuch, as the word of God. So when the Sadducees, for example, in Matthew 22, have a debate with Jesus about the resurrection, he says to them, have you not read what was said to you by God? And then he quotes what God says in the book of Exodus and 3 verse 6, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob in Matthew 22:31. Now we have a habit of referring to the Old Testament, which is part of the problem. We live in a neophilic society where we automatically privilege what is new simply because it is new. Um, and so we tend to think that old means out of date. But that isn't how Jesus sees it. He says, it is the word of God to you. And we are to live by every word that comes from the mouth of God in Matthew 4 verse 4. So it's all the word of God for Jesus and Jesus doesn't renounce it. If we look at how Jesus deals with the law and the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, Jesus quotes how other people see the law and misrepresent it. And he says, well, if you listen to me, I'll show you the right way to interpret that and to build on it. He's saying that now you are my disciple, my teaching is normative for you, and the benefits of that is that you will have a life uh, which is going to be built on solid rock and is not going to be in, uh, in a state of disintegration and collapse. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is challenging wrong uses of the law and he is saying that there is a right way of understanding it under his direction. But he does not negate it. He's absolutely explicit on that point. He talks about not taking away from it. He says in Matthew 5 verse 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfil them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus sees himself uh, as adding to what God has said. Jesus is adding to it in an authoritative and definitive way. Um, now, of course, um, that uh, was in itself usually controversial um, to uh, Jews of his day and still is for people outside the Christian tradition. But Jesus is adding to and fulfilling the canon of scripture. He is not negating it or replacing it. And Jesus' teaching here is applied to the whole world. Everyone in the whole world is called to repent and to become a disciple of Jesus. And if you are following Jesus, then this is how you are to live, and it's normative for everyone. And that is why we go into the entire world. Jesus' summary of the law and the prophets, loving God and loving neighbour, covers both Jews and Gentiles. So it's ironic that some people argue that we shouldn't be paying attention to biblical law because we should be focusing on Jesus. But that misses the point. It's precisely because we focus on Jesus that we have to take seriously the things that he takes seriously. There's a phrase in the uh, Jewish writings of the Mishnah written around about 200 AD that says, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. The idea was that you would be following your rabbi so closely that you got covered in his dust as you walked behind. So Jesus took Torah seriously and he expects us to as well, partly because, and this brings me on to my second point, biblical law teaches us who Jesus is. We say Jesus fulfills the law, um, so we say that we don't need to know anything about it. But that's bizarre, isn't it? It's precisely because the Torah prophesizes about about Jesus, the person who we say matters most in our lives, that we need to understand it, because we are talking about Jesus. 
We are talking about one person and one life that is so cosmically and eternally significant that we need the entire history of God's dealings with humanity and with his people just to understand who he is. So if we don't really know much about Torah and we don't understand how it relates to him, then we have diminished our understanding of who Jesus is. I think it's a bit like having a statue of someone and then somebody comes along and uh, chips a bit off. It's not such a good likeness then, is it? Or imagine somebody coming along with a metal pole and just knocking the head off. And I think this is a bit what it's like uh, when we don't pay attention to those parts of the Bible which Jesus says talk about him. Now, of course, we say, I meet Jesus every day, and um, I'm sure that's true, I hope it's true. But we have to be careful that we're not just entertaining our own personal vision of who we think Jesus is, which doesn't match up to who Jesus really is. We could be in danger of ending up with a Jesus, which is just the best version of ourselves. Or we could end up with strict Jesus or indulgent Jesus, the Jesus of our own sinful imaginations. When we understand biblical law better, we get a better understanding of who Jesus is. If we try to understand Jesus without it, then we are not going to understand him as well as we might. It's a bit like reading a musical score. If we just focus on the top line, then it isn't going to sound as good as if it would if we were to bring in all the other notes. God expects us to play the whole thing. So Jesus took Torah seriously, and he expects us to as well, and that's partly because biblical law teaches us who Jesus is. So it's not surprising then that, and this brings me to my third point, the New Testament takes Torah seriously and expects us to as well. The New Testament takes Torah seriously, but as in the Sermon on the Mount and in the Gospels, it's Torah understood under Jesus' direction. There's a whole tradition in the Bible going right back to Moses about what counts and doesn't count as a valid interpretation of biblical law. Law has to be interpreted. Uh, I mentioned a moment ago uh, that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus challenged bad interpretations of Torah, uh, or current in his day, and he put forward his own authoritative uh, interpretations on certain key issues. And uh, we find that Paul, also challenges bad interpretations of the law and inter upholds right interpretations. So it follows from this that there are two things that we need to do as Christians in regard to biblical law. Number one, we've got to uphold um, the right use of the law, as Jesus and Paul did, and we also have to oppose the wrong use of the law, as Jesus and Paul did. Now, the fact that there are such things as right and wrong interpretations of Torah is part of the reason why there is some difficulty around the subject. And here we have to recognise that the New Testament's word for law, or nomos, which has the sense of norms, can mean different things in different contexts. So we always have to look at the context to see what's going on when the New Testament talks about law. So there are times we'll find when we have to oppose the wrong use of Torah. So for example, in the early church, uh, it got used as a kind of cultic badge of honour in order to put up barriers between Jews and Gentiles. Well, that was the wrong use of the law. Why? Because Jesus came to abolish ethnic distinctions between Jews and Gentiles uh, in order to make one family of the people of God, one olive tree, one table fellowship. Um, so if we say that um, obeying circumcision and food laws are necessary for salvation, then we are denying the gospel. And so we see how Paul deals with uh, false teachers and their motives in Galatians. <clears throat> he says, look, the only reason why you're requiring uh, the Galatian church to be circumcised in the first place because because you want to try and curry favour with Jewish authorities by converting Gentiles who <clears throat> a sort of form of pseudo-Judaism uh, and you want to create this kind of Jewish sect of which you're the leaders and you're doing all of that uh, because you want to uh, avoid persecution for the cross of Christ. Well that's a wrong use of the law isn't it and Paul says it brings death 
and there are other examples of this from elsewhere in Paul's letters. But to speak of a wrong way of using the law is to acknowledge that there is also a right way of using the law, and that is upheld in the New Testament. Paul concludes in Romans 7 verse 12, So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. And elsewhere in 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul says famously, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness uh, so that uh, the person, uh, man or woman and person of God uh, can be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we've seen that Jesus took Torah seriously. He expects us to as well, partly because biblical law teaches us who Jesus is. And we've also seen that the New Testament takes Torah seriously and expects us to as well. And this is partly because, and this brings me to my next point, we are risen with Christ. Now one of our hang-ups about biblical law is that we are scared of sliding into legalism. If you say anything to a Christian audience about biblical law, I find that somebody is um, prone to mishear you as saying, ah, but you are putting us under the law. Now, of course, as I mentioned a moment ago, that's to interpret Galatians without really any regard for the problems that Paul was actually addressing. So it is important to say that another reason why biblical law matters is because of the resurrection, which, let's face it, is nothing whatever to do with legalism. So as a Christian, I am saved by grace alone through faith in Christ. I am raised with Christ. I am seated with him in heavenly places. God looks on me as he looks on Christ. As Calvin says, there is no gap in space or time between me and the risen Lord Jesus. So if it is the case that I am joined to Christ, who is the messianic king, so that what is true of Jesus is true of me, then that has enormous ethical implications. If he embodies the Torah in his kingly rule of caring for the weak, of upholding justice and all the rest, then these things must be true in my life as well, it must be true of our lives of our corporate churches as well, because I am in Christ and that is what Christ is like. On top of that, of course, Jesus' bodily resurrection affirms our humanity. It tells us that there is a right way for all humans to live. The resurrection is about the future. It's God's future purposes announced in the present. Jesus is the first fruits of those who are raised from the dead. And if this is pointing towards what is going to happen in the future, then it must in an important sense be true now. Of course, there is a not yet dimension to all of this. But no Christian can sensibly say, well, I know I'm going to live like Jesus in the future, but I don't need to live in that way now. It doesn't make sense. Our calling is to live as the people we in fact are. And so the resurrection carries ethical authority, and that's not surprising. Uh, if we go back, we look at Israel's exodus from bondage in Egypt. Um, well, uh, Jesus, the cross and uh, New Testament describes uh, Jesus' crucifixion as the exodus, a new exodus. And, uh, and obviously it's a more intense form of the exodus uh, because um, uh, we are delivered not simply from bondage in Egypt, but from bondage to sin and death. But if Israel's own exodus from bondage to Egypt carried ethical authority for her, um, so I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, uh, and then we get some laws about how Israel is to treat slaves and how she is to treat asylum seekers based on her own experience of being a nation of escaped slaves and a nation of successful asylum seekers, um, well, she's expected to treat them in a certain way because that's part of her identity. Um, she was delivered from slavery and found uh, asylum, and that's reflected in the content of the laws. Um, so Israel's exodus from bondage in Egypt carried ethical authority for the Israelites. So how much more does the, our exodus from the bondage of sin and death carry ethical authority for us? 
as a result of what Jesus has done. Precisely because of what Jesus has done for us, and because we are raised to new life, our lives can't be the same. We have a new identity. We have union with Christ. And that is why the New Testament holds together Christian conversion and ethical authority. So in Colossians 3 verse 1, which is a great book on the subject of union with Christ, Paul says, well, since you have been raised with Christ, which is the case, then you should set your hearts on things above. In other words, there's the command. So the resurrection carries ethical authority. And we see this over and over again in Paul's teaching where he says, well, if you call yourself a Christian, there are certain things that you must do and there are certain things that you must not do. And so that is why we have ethical continuity with the Torah, because Jesus fulfills it and we are in Christ. That is our identity. And so the things which uh, tend to attract the uh, death penalty in the Hebrew Bible are grounds for exclusion from the kingdom of heaven in the New Testament. Now that is not legalism, it is simply a basic function of the fact that you have union with Christ. And if this is who I am, then I should live like it now. Now, historically, these are things which have used to be well understood. Augustine and Luther, for example, spoke about the difference between being under the law, uh, which was good, um, sorry, sorry, under the law being bad, uh, but living in the law, which was good. So what stops the slide into legalism? Well, surely it is a recognition that public law is all about life and what it means to live life well. Jesus summarises the law and the prophets as depending or hanging on two commandments. Matthew 22, verse 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. Quoting here from Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Now love, of course, is a quality of relationships. So as far as Jesus is concerned, the big idea underlying biblical law is relationships. It's all concerned with the quality of relationships, human flourishing, and what it means to live life well. Now that is the opposite, isn't it, of what we fear from legalism. As the psalmist says, I run in the path of your commands, for you have set my heart free. The idea that biblical law automatically leads to legalism is just absurd. It is not a duty or a burden, but a way of resourcing us to enjoy life. They are invitations to life. They are just better ways of doing things. Um, it's a bit like a sachet of plant food. I always think, which you add to your cut flowers, it brings out the bloom, brings out the best in them. Now, people may say in response to that, well, if we love God and love our neighbour, then we're already doing everything that Torah requires. So, again, why should we bother with it? But I think that's a bit disingenuous. It seems to affirm that biblical law, um, seems to affirm what biblical law is about. But at the same time, it shuts the door on it because it says that we need not pay any attention to the detail. But the detail is important. And that brings me to the next reason why we need to take biblical law seriously. We should take biblical law seriously because it means we can be specific about what it means to love God and love our neighbour. We can say things like, love God, and love your neighbour, and everybody can agree with us because that's just all warm and fuzzy. We think we get to define what these terms mean, love, justice. But when God commands us to love our neighbour or to do justice, how do we know what that means? Well, if you look at where the love your neighbour commandment is found, for example, we find that it's in Leviticus 19, which is concerned with social justice. And it's very specific. It means being generous towards immigrants. It means paying people immediately for their work. It means not 
exploiting other people's weaknesses for laugh and so on. Lots of things that have, would have enormous challenges for our economy and our culture if we were to uh, engage with them, um, even for half a second. It's the context which shows us what love your neighbour means. It's where we get the substance from. So we can't ignore the detail here. We need the detail. The detail is how we respond to the creative redemptive, sustaining and sanctifying acts of God. Because God is a God of order. We don't just respond in the abstract. It has to be specific and detailed if it's going to mean anything. But of course it's when we start to get specific and detailed, uh, I'm talking about the things that Leviticus 19 talks about, sexual behaviour, use of money, limiting our take for the environment and you know, those are just things which um, those which are adjacent to the love your neighbour verse, and that's just one chapter, well then we start threatening people's interests. And that shows us, doesn't it, where the rubber hits the road. It shows us what loving our neighbour really means. And that applies even to some of the detail that we might think of as being trivial. For example, Paul's teaching regarding the obligations owed by an apostle in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 7. Uh, Paul quotes um, from uh, Deuteronomy, he says, For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox when it is treading out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is, returned? God is concerned? Does he not speak entirely for our sake? Now that, I think, is exactly the sort of law that we would be inclined to write off. Oh, well, it's all written just for an agricultural period. You know, it doesn't have any contemporary relevance. But the trouble is, um, the New Testament does have this habit uh, of continually taking us back and reaffirming our Torah. It's the same thing in regard to loving God. Again, biblical law helps us to be specific about what that means. Not that it tells us everything. Its purpose, as the Psalms remind us, is to make us wise. And that is why we find us ourselves in the sort of territory of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, well, of course you shouldn't murder, but if you really want to be like your Heavenly Father, then you won't even nurse anger against your brother. The point is that wherever there's a tendency to go hazy on what loving God or neighbour requires, Biblical law is there to point the way. And this is true uh, not only for private but also for public life. And this brings us on to our final reason. Biblical law helps us to be specific about what it means to love God and to love neighbour so that we can be a force for good in public life. If we are serious about loving our neighbour, then sooner or later we have got to be concerned with public life and the organisation of our society. It's not enough simply to be concerned with the victims of, for example, people trafficking. We have to be concerned with the causes of people trafficking and the way in which our society is organised which allows that to happen. And this too is a vital part of what love for neighbour means. It's easy to criticise people in power. Sometimes it's fun too. But it's not enough simply for Christians to criticise those in power who have responsibility. We are called to put forward a different and positive agenda. In 1 Peter 2 verse 15, Peter speaks about the importance of doing good. He says, For this is the will of God, uh, so this applies to all of us, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Bruce Winter in his book uh, Seek the Welfare of the City argues that this doesn't simply mean living an ethical, decent life. It means rather work for public benefactions. And in a context where first century cities would have had food riots over lack of food, there was a duty on wealthy members of the church to ensure civic order and cohesion by providing corn and food. By doing good, by being a publicly visible part of the welfare system, for example, you are seen as being a good citizen, and so the credibility and the reputation of the church is established. 
And that was all the more important uh, in a context of quite difficult relationships with the Roman authorities. The same is true today. We are to seek the welfare of the city. It's a way of saying to the government, look how we are positively able to make a difference in our communities. It's another way in which the resurrection and the fact that we are raised in Christ carries ethical authority. Because the resurrection shows God's commitment to our world and to its restoration. So where are we going to get a positive social vision from? Well, obviously, if we're Christians, we have got to get it from God's word. That's the only standard. And if we don't get it from God's word, um, we're just going to be baptising the later social or political theory or ideology and using that instead. So we need to be studying all of God's word and we can't afford to neglect any part of it. God doesn't waste his breath. But developing and applying a positive alternative social vision is hard work. Um, we think about something, something an image like of the miners in uh, Job 28, the hard search for wisdom crawling down deep tunnels um, uh, of engagement, deep, um, painful, sacrificial engagement in order to bring up these nuggets um, and jewels from out of the darkness. So this is something that we have to work out in the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. Now, some people might uh, ask at this point, well, why can't we just draw on Jesus' teachings when it comes to public policy? Why, again, should we bother with biblical law? Well, part of the reason is that biblical law is the genre of scripture that is most obviously concerned with the organisation of civic society. So clearly it is of particular and direct relevance when it comes to developing a biblical social vision or, and, and agenda. Of course, Jesus' teachings to me as a private individual on turning the other cheek enables me to be salt and light. But it doesn't necessarily tell me what to do when I'm a judge, adjudicating in a criminal law case. What do I do then? Or what about Jesus' teaching on the importance of serving God and mammon? God, not mammon, I should say. Clearly that teaches me where my priorities should lie when it comes to spending God's money. But what about other people's money? It doesn't tell me what to do when I'm making day-to-day -day decisions in my job at the bank. Do I just give all the money away? So this is where our study of biblical law is of value. It's because Torah has a public dimension that we can find out what structures and priorities God values in society as a whole. In fact, I'd go so far as to suggest that biblical law gives us a better sense of what Jesus would do if he had our job in the courtroom or in the bank or whatever. And so we might find, for example, in Torah that, you know, justice is, yes, it's about punishing the oppressor, but it's also about lifting up the oppressed. That can include the perpetrator sometimes as well. And because the images of justice are life-giving things like a river, an amos, we should try to have constructive penalties that give the opportunity for putting things right between the parties and giving everyone a fresh start where that is possible. Now that gives us some ideas, doesn't it, of how Jesus would act or might act if he had our job as a judge, which we might not work out simply from Jesus' teaching on turning the other cheek. So it's not the case, I think, that we have to choose either between Jesus' teachings or biblical law. It's both and. And we need to get into the habit of reading one in the light of the other. That is all part of what it means to think of Jesus as the fulfilment of Torah. Now there are still those who I think at this point would try to block up, block off this reading or of Scripture. You might say it's a flawed interpretation or something because it's not focused enough on Christ. But again, I think we need to recognise who Christ is. He is the cosmic Christ, he, and God plans that all authority should be summed up in him. Colossians 2 verse 9, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness of life in him, 
who is the head of all rule and authority. So if we don't act on that and seek to apply that into every area of life, including public life, we're saying that there is a part of the world over which Christ does not exercise dominion. And it is precisely the sort of thinking that lies behind Paul's image of Christians being citizens of heaven. Now, very often this is taken to mean that, as citizens of heaven, we don't have to be engaged in the public square, because after all, we're just waiting to go to heaven. But nothing could be farther from Paul's mind here. He is writing to the Philippians in Philippi, which was a Roman colony. If someone in that colony of Philippi had said, well, we are citizens of Rome, that wouldn't have meant, well, let's just lie back and just look forward to living in Rome. Because the Roman emperors didn't want the Philippians to come to Rome, the capital was already overcrowded and underemployed, uh, what they wanted uh, was for the uh, Roman citizen to, in a place like Philippi, uh, to bring Roman culture to bear on their immediate environment and the surrounding area, and so to expand Roman influence. Their job wasn't to go to Rome, but to do in Philippi the things that were done in Rome. And that is a picture that Paul has in mind when he speaks of heavenly citizenship. We are, in that sense, we're kind of like heavenly colonists, and our job is to bring the life and rule of heaven to bear on earth. We are to do our best to order our civic life so that it matches the way things are done in heaven, on earth, as it is in heaven. Um, so this is really the challenge, I think, for all of us, um, that at the end of the day, um, we are redeemed. God redeems us, um, not just to put us on a shelf uh, or to put us in a shop window, um, but so that we would, our destiny is to rule and reign um, with um, Jesus uh, as, as Messiah. Um, so we have our, the upward call uh, for all of us as Christians uh, is to think about how we can exercise or how we partner with God in, in bringing his rule uh, to bear on our patch. Uh, and I'm sure some people who are, who are listening to this um, are uh, perhaps aspiring formally uh, to exercise political office or um, other people will be exercising their actual and potential influence in, in other ways. But we all have this calling um, to bring uh, the, the, the life of heaven and God's rule uh, to bear increasingly uh, upon the world. And that um, anticipates our, our future destiny. Uh, and it also means that um, there is some calling account, uh, calling to account. Uh, that needs to be done um, to uh, authorities in the here and now. And that is really all part of our calling, it's all part of our challenge, but it's a very deep challenge, I think, for, for all of us to think through and to work out what it means for us to give our primary allegiance not to Rome, but to heaven, and not to Caesar, but to Jesus. And in rising to that challenge of what it means to love God and to love our neighbour and to be a force for good in public life, we need to be fully equipped with all of the resources that God has for us. And this includes the wisdom that is to be found in all of the scriptures. And this includes biblical law. Well, I hope you enjoyed that talk as much as I did and found it um, as informative and challenging as I did. Um, I'm delighted now to have Jonathan Burnside, Professor Jonathan Burnside, um, live um, to join us for some Q&A. Um, and also Andrea Williams, um, Chief Executive of Christian Concern. Evening to you both. Thank you for joining us. Um, thank you so much for that talk, Jonathan. Really insightful, very clear, very clear points there. I wonder if I could kick off with a question. Why do you think it is, having you presented a very strong case for why we should bother with the law, why do you think it is that many Christians and perhaps even churches don't bother with biblical law? Well, I think because it works for everybody. Um, it gets us all off the hook, doesn't it? 
Um, I mean, I was hinting at the end there that there's a, an issue about, um, uh, as I said at the start, there's my introduction of what is public law represents a, a vision of a, of a society which is accountable to God, and there is some calling and kind to be done. Mm. Um, um, but that's challenging, isn't it? Uh, and, yes, but um, uh, I suppose, it, yeah, but non Christians, understandably, right, don't want to ignore biblical law. Fair enough. Okay. But for Christians, right, and churches, what about what about them? Surely they should want to engage. Um, well, well, they should, but but the position, as as we, we very well know, is that that often doesn't happen. And and I think part of um, I think uh, isn't it also a bit nuanced? Avoiding the challenge of biblical law means that you avoid the challenge of speaking truth to power. So, and I, mean, I, I, it, I mean, it's not as if that we uh, we don't have vested interests here. I mean, it's um, it, it, it can keep us in a place where, where we don't have to engage politically, and that's always easier than engaging politically. And it also suits people in power as well, because they then don't get the challenge. They're not faced with some of those ethical challenges that would otherwise come their way. So I think those pressures can sort of keep us in a place um, where we are less inclined uh, to grapple with the whole, whole of Scripture. And let's face it, this is one of, one of the things that biblical law does. I mean, I, mean, I get that quote that says that um, all Scripture is, is God, and it's therefore equipping us for doing certain jobs. So if there are parts of Scripture which we are not engaging with, then that means that we are being de-skilled. We are de-skilling ourselves from doing certain jobs. And one of those jobs that we are de-skilled in is um, setting out an alternative political and, and social vision. That's but I think, Jonathan, you have spent years studying this and you can see clearly an alternative political uh, and social vision for society as a result of being steeped in the older and new, newer testaments. The one, te so you, 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 can, you, you can see this, but for many Christians, they will look at... Um, death penalties or particular rules in Leviticus and not see any way in which that can apply uh, or how they could any in any way speak that in, even into their churches. But this and, comes back to and, and also the kind of, you know, Jesus Christ came to um, fulfil the law by by his death on the cross. So, uh, so we are saved, so we are redeemed. So some of these uh, things seem so distant. And I yes. think, and I think that I mean, as you have done in your presentation, but it's it is to to help us in uh, in twenty twenty two understand how how are we really to unpack uh, Leviticus if if we're in if we're in a live stream if we're in a rate if we're in the uh, in the university a lecture hall if we're on a if we're on a talk show. How are we really going to deal with um, some of the punishments meted out in Leviticus? How are we going to really deal with that? How are you going to deal with the straight up and that deserves death? What about keeping the Sabbath? Okay, well, I, I understand completely where you're coming from, but um, uh, we can't begin to engage with that unless we know what the material is. And that means exposure. So that means that we need to be reading the whole of, whole of the whole of scripture. Uh, I'm really pleased to say that the online community group of which I'm a part in these COVID times, we were set a challenge uh, last week, which was to read the whole of Deuteronomy by yesterday um, for a discussion we had. And that, you know, that's that's just a normal thing that you're doing. Yes, you should read the whole block text, understand it, talk about it. So we've got to get, I mean, think about what 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 is said and Torah. You know, you, you I and mean, it's always been a basic part of even of Jewish education, you teach it to your children, talk about it all the time. So we've got to get exposure to it. We've got to um, acquire the tools, we've got to be competent. That means it's got to be talked, it's got to be preached, it's got to be read, it's got to be preached. Um, and, and then when it's part of us, when it's part of our corporate life, it's part of our worldview, then when you put it on the spot and you're given a question about something or other, um, you know it's not just all about this death penalty or that death penalty. You know uh, it's about a saving God who's bringing life to his people. So, um, so Jonathan, we did, we, did, right. we did get a question exactly like this on YouTube. And by the way, if you're watching live on YouTube or Facebook, do keep your questions coming in. But Bill Camp, too, on YouTube says, 
So should we have the death penalty for not obeying the Sabbath, as in the fourth commandment, collecting sticks on the Sabbath day? This is the classic question that always comes up, isn't it? It's not necessarily the specific yeah. one, but questions like this that say, well, how can you possibly talk about biblical law and bothering with it when it's got these absurd to our 20th century minds, 21st century minds, penalties and regulations? Um, I think part of the issue here is, um, and this is this is not, um, I, I don't know who posed the question, but this is not a, a, a criticism of, of anybody who, who raises that, 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 that as an issue. But well, can I just say, Jonathan, this is actually the crux. Yeah, yeah. Okay, because, so, so, so let's... So is, so let's level, you have to, there has to be an entry point, because this is, people shut down because they haven't yeah. read, like, your community group, Deuteronomy. So this is actually a crux question in terms yeah, of so, so opening... Let's, so let's, let's, deal with, <laughs> let's deal with the crux question. I'm going to, Andrea. Um, <laughs> so, so this is not a criticism of anybody asking the question, but a lot of the reason why these questions do get thrown out uh, is because um, it, as in that example, oh, you know, how can you take seriously a God who executes people just for picking up sticks? And and that sort of posture can be quite self-serving because it means, well, we don't have to take seriously a God who's bad. Um, and I think a lot of the um, uh, opposition towards public law um, and presenting it as being bad and poisonous and all this kind of stuff, it's just kind of a way of saying, well, look, um, we can just keep God off the throne because we're not threatened by a God who's bad. But if we take the time to look at what a text like um, uh, that text in Numbers about the, the wood gatherer is saying, um, the picture becomes quite different because, um, uh, I don't want to go into a whole lot of detail here, but, but the long and the short of it is, is that um, it, it's in the context of, of um, uh, resting on, on Shabbat, on the Sabbath, not working, uh, what the Israelites typically did in terms of work was preparing manna uh, to be eaten because you couldn't eat manna as it was. You had to cook it. To cook it, you had to collect sticks in order to make fire. Uh, and so the question is, did somebody who went out on 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 the, the day of rest and Shabbat to gather sticks uh, was that a was that violating uh, the commandment against working? Um, because it's not necessarily work, but it's preparatory to the work. And the critical thing here to notice is that gathering sticks is like gathering the straw that the Israelites were doing uh, in, in Egypt. If you remember, uh, when they were in Egypt, they were told to build brick, uh, to make bricks for Pharaoh without, uh, without straw. They had to scatter across the whole land of Egypt in order to find the straw to make these bricks and make these quota. It was the very emblem, the symbol of their oppression. And what God did in the Exodus was that he brought them out of um, totalitarianism, uh, symbolized by that kind of economic um, uh, degradation that they were put in of gathering the straw to make the bricks. So if you're coming out of um, Egypt and God has done this wonderful thing for you, and what are you doing on this day of rest when you're able to celebrate the fact that God has done something great for you that you don't have to go out and gather, and you go out and gather sticks. Well, basically what you're saying is, I don't want to be part of this community anymore. Um, I wish I was back in Egypt doing all the things that I was doing in Egypt. And had you stayed in Egypt at that time uh, as a Jew, you'd have died. So you can see that um, what, what's happening here is that God is bringing the community into life, but people within the community are wanting to say, I don't want this. Um, okay, so, so look, Jonathan, listen, that's a, a brilliant answer. Complexion on it. Yeah, that, that's a brilliant answer to that question. Um, thank you for that. And it's, it's really, really helpful to think about that and to get that kind of context. But if your think. posture is that God wants to bring life, not yeah. the purpose of the Torah is to bring life, yeah. then that changes how yeah. you... Um, the, thing how, is, though, how you know, the thing is, though, to push back a, a little bit, Jonathan... Um, it's quite hard for people to reach that conclusion on their own, is it not? Right? You, um, this you, is you, you've gone, you've gone and done a lot of background, a lot of thinking has gone into that conclusion there. And you know, when when you explain it like you think, oh yeah, wow, that's that's a really good explanation. But you know, and I'm sure you've got. But even then, the death penalty seems quite well, but... hard for it. To a like, like to my, my, my plea in this talk is that we have to take it seriously. There's no excuse for not teaching the whole of Scripture. Why don't we have? 
Um, in, I mean, I, my area of research is in biblical law, but why am I the only person um, in, in, in the law school in biblical law? I mean, it's because the subject is not taken seriously. We don't have people really studying biblical law. We I mean, might get, say, in um, chairs in Old Testament and various, I mean, but, but that's the whole of the Old Testament. They may not be spent putting very much time into the Pentateuch. And yet it was the Pentateuch that, that took all the focus of that early assault on the Bible uh, in the uh, 18, uh, in, in, in 19th centuries. Um, so, the, so we mustn't underestimate the fact that there is a major work task of retrieval here in terms of making sense of this, understanding it. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not surprised we have all of these hang-ups about the subject and why, mm -hmm. uh, as you say, well, yes, it is going to take a bit of time in order to recover that, but I'm afraid that is what we need. Uh, we need um, to give it the attention uh, and the time that it deserves. We need to recover the whole vocabulary of the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament, and that includes public law, because once we lose that, our understanding of, of the New Testament um, is going to disappear as well. Yes. Okay. Well, that's that's really helpful, and part of it, part of your answer, I think, is a reminder that it requires hard work to sort of get to the bottom of it. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why people don't bother because it actually is hard work to reinterpret and work out how to apply the- um, That's true of any part of the scripture, isn't it? But we, we, we've got lots of great New Testament scholars. We've been blessed, but hugely by wonderful yeah. New Testament scholars who mm. have given us, an, and, and we need people in every generation uh, mm. to, to um, uh, bring uh, the light and the treasures of, of scripture and make them available to everyone. We need that. Yeah. This just happens to be an area um, where we have um, given up that fight. Yeah. And yeah. Happened, now, listen, listen, Jonathan, there was an interesting comment from Mark Fairpo, I hope I pronounced his name right, on, on Facebook earlier, about 8.20 p.m., talking about the meaning of antinomians. And I wonder if you think that we have become antinomian. And he actually quotes uh, from John Wesley's um, um, catechism or something like that, um, saying... Have we leaned towards antinomianism? Question 18. We're afraid we have. Question 19. What is antinomianism? The doctrine that makes void the law through faith. 20. What are the, the main pillars hereof? That Christ abolished the moral law, that therefore Christian not glad by to observe it, that branch of one branch of Christian liberty is liberty from obeying. Presumably it goes on to say the biblical law. Um, what has Christ abolished? The ritual law of Moses, etc. So do you think that we are antinomians, as Wesley Wesley warned that we, we were becoming back in the 1700s? 44. Um, well, we, uh, we we may not think that we are antinomian, um, but functionally perhaps we are. The test is simply to look at our behaviour. In what sense? Behaviour in what sense? Um, okay, so uh, if we're, well, Jesus says, well, Jesus is not antinomian, is he? Um, right. Jesus says, I've not come to abolish the law, I've come to fulfil it. Um, so as I said in my talk, um, you know, if we're in Christ, then all of the things that, that he took seriously, which are the fulfillment and the embodiment of the law, seeking justice, you know, caring for, for, for the orphan. We and the are anti I mean, or, or that, yeah. um, if we're not doing that, we are antinomian. Right. Right. I mean, and how do you balance that with the church? Look at what look at what today we've allowed to come into the church. Look yeah. at our own standards of behaviour, even within the church. Look at how, you know, how are we seeking the welfare of the city? How are we speaking truth to power at this particular time? How are we speaking mm. truth in terms of uh, God's laws? God's laws mm. for uh, how we should look after um, mm. our bodies, how we should look after what ma what family is, what marriage is, uh, mm. what we should do with our time, what we should do with our money. God's yeah. laws. Yeah. How do you balance, though, um, Jonathan, you know, you're, you're talking about biblical law and you mentioned in the talk even the accusation of sort of legalism um, and then, but salvation is by faith, right? How do you balance these two? You want to emphasise the law and the, the requirements to obey these things and so on, whilst also saying salvation is by faith. How do you t walk that tightrope if there is one to walk in the middle of these two things? Yes, it's funny, isn't it? Because um, faith and law aren't really played off against each other. I was just actually, funnily enough, I was um, uh, reading something in Hebrews where it talks about Moses saying, by faith Moses did this, by faith Moses did that, Abraham. You know, people are acting in faith. Uh, and 
uh, and their obedience to uh, what God was requiring of them um, was the expression of their faith, you know. Um, mm. So I don't think really we can we can play off uh, law and faith in, in, in that sense because um, our, our calling is to is to know who God is. Uh, that means knowing His character, knowing His ways. Um, you know, we have all of these calls to the patriarchs about um, walking wholeheartedly um, before God and justice and righteousness. All of these things have content. Um, so, um, so I, and 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 a life of faith is a life that's lived well uh, in accordance with God's requirements. So obedience is an act of faith. A life of faith it commences with a life. It's a it's a it's a it's a life. Um, a life of faith um, is not something that's blind. It's something that postures itself towards God. It's a, something that it's a life that waits upon God. It's a life that seeks His truth in Scripture. Indeed, uh, I'll come alongside uh, Jonathan here to say in His law, the how now that we should live, and that you find th from from throughout the whole the whole of Scripture, in waiting on God, in having faith in God, in having uh, and seeking to live out his righteousness, so we see by faith more clearly. So we actually see that which is not, even that which is not seen, because we understand uh, beyond our, our mortal, uh, just beyond what is uh, mortal in a sense, beyond beyond just what life deals deals us. But actually, we see ourselves in the context. Um, of the whole scope of eternity and what we were planned for by faith. So, so do yes, you think, yes, Jonathan, that people um, have too much of a sort of dichotomy between Old Testament and New Testament? They think the Old Testament, okay, so those laws were relevant for people of the Old Testament, but then clearly not relevant now, right? So they teach us something about the character of God, but, you know, it's kind of like you have to delve a, lot, a long way to get there. Whereas the New Testament is kind of clear and obvious and that that is relevant, so we need to worry about that a lot more and, and the Old Testament, well, for those who are really interested, like Jonathan Burnside, he can look at it. But I'm going to just bother the New Testament. What would you say in response to that kind of point? Well, what what I say to that is what I said at the beginning of the talk is that um, uh, we have to handle Scripture the way Jesus handles Scripture. Jesus says that um, uh, we are to live according to every word that comes comes from the mouth of God. Um, so we have to take seriously the things that he takes seriously if we are if we are uh, claim to followers of, of Jesus. So um, uh, and that, you know, and it's really striking. I mean, the, the New Testament everywhere presupposes the int the point that I, I made in talk is that um, Jesus is um, uh, somebody whose whose life is so cosmically uh, and eternally significant that we need the entire history of God's dealings with his people in order to in order to understand who he is. Um, so given that, um, the Hebrew Bible and the entire witness of God's dealing with, with his people to um, teach us who Jesus is, is clearly not uh, an optional extra. Um, we need it all. Um, mm -hmm. OK, so what about people who might say that the church, you know, the, the Old Testament law, OK, it's relevant for Israel and it's kind of relevant for the church to live up to those ethical standards. But, you know, for the world, for the for the politics of today, we can really only expect them to abide by natural law because they don't really, you know, not, they're not going to accept special revelation like the Old Testament laws and stuff. So, you know, shouldn't we just worry about trying to argue in terms of natural law and not point to biblical law that much? But I think the problem here is I think what we're talking about is, is that it becomes a whole series of playoffs. So people want to play off the New Testament against the Hebrew Bible, parts of the Hebrew Bible against Torah. They want to play off uh, faith against law. Um, and uh, and now we're kind of playing off, um, what, what was your... Um, and, and well, and that's the law against biblical law, I suppose. And yet the Bible always, in its wisdom, holds all of these things together. Psalm 19 uh, is a direct refutation of, of, of that idea that you can somehow play off biblical law and natural law. So think about how Psalm 19 uh, talks about heavens are declaring the, the, the glory of God. Um, it, it, it's talking about um, uh, the, 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 the speech uh, which is being poured out by the heavens and therefore can be heard by everybody under the heavens. It's, it's universal. 
Mm. And yet the psalmist moves directly from that into a different stanza, which has a different sort of uh, poetic meter, and um, to talk about the law of the Lord, it's Torah Adonai, specifically referring to the law given at, um, at Sinai. Right. Um, and so it, it's perfect. And all the things that are, that are associated with Torah, um, light and luminosity and so on, are associated with, with what we think about in the stars and the heavens. There is continuity between the two. Uh, and that's a yeah. narrative movement of the scriptures as well. We move from creation to covenant. Uh, we talk about how God has ordered uh, the cosmos and we move to the giving of the law. These are, these are never presented as things which should be played off against one another. And the psalmist, David, um, when he comes to the end of it, um, you know, he, he's, uh, let's, um, well, let's just bring up the psalm because it's such a great one. Um, he says at the end, um, 19, yeah. let, let the words, psalm 19, let the words of my mouth and meditation, my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I mean, he's, and he's saying, you know, deliver me from hidden thoughts, keep, keep um, your, your servant from presumptuous sins. Um, he, he's saying that the way in which I order my life so that, that it's in tune with the universe that God has created um, is through Torah. Um, uh, and, and that becomes his prayer, that becomes his voice, his speech uh, right. at, at the end of it. But, you know, they're not played off against each other. Um, okay, so but you, but I still think I you think have to I don't remember. I think it's like the blessing. God through natural law, um, we come to know God through His revelation. Um, this this, this amazing idea, you know, creation to covenant and order, and Psalm 119: Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep His statutes and seek Him with all their heart. Uh, and they do no wrong, but know his ways. You've laid down precepts. They are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would be not, not be put to shame. We live in a world of shame. We live in a world of brokenness. And people know not their shame. They actually know their shame. They know their shame, uh, but they, they, they don't understand that it is shame. And the mm. reason why they feel unwell and sad and lost is because they are ashamed because the law, where we are in Great Britain today, turns turns the law on its head and actually says this behavior is great behavior. It's fun behavior, but it's not fun behavior. It's it's behavior that shames and makes people guilty. And then mm. they don't understand why, because they have not been taught the statutes of God. They've not been taught what is order, what is beauty what it means to be created in the image of God. Mm. And, you know, when we throw all of this off and, and when we understand God's laws, when we throw all of that off, mm. then we live, we leave a world that's sick and, and, and hurting and dying. Mm. And the law of God played out uh, from creation to the covenant brings order and life in abundance and life in fullness. And that is what we have. And when we don't understand it, when we don't understand his pattern and his purpose and his order, when we don't proclaim it, mm. um, then we leave a world hurting. And it's mm. our job. Mm. I mean, he's, he's only got us. And, it, mm. and if we are, if we don't learn, if we don't learn the stuff that Jonathan wants to teach us, if we don't unpack the law as he wants to help us unpack it, then we live, we live then, then our own walk is the lesser for it. Our own understanding is the lesser for it. Yeah. And you know, and and our yeah. and our understanding of the Bible is. But what about what about our our witness as well, though? So I'm coming to so so yeah. Jonathan, you saying you know instead of referring to natural law, we should really refer to biblical law when we argue in the public square about morality and ethics and and this kind of thing. Okay. Um. Big question. Um. Uh, I'm going to answer that by, by reference to what Andrea has just said in relation to Psalm 119, which is, of course, a parallel text to Psalm 19. In fact, I needn't have given the talk at all. Andrea could just have read Psalm 119, and that would just have been great. And that was a major challenge to anybody um, who would say, um, why, why should we, um, yes. you know, why, because yes. Psalm 119 shows how, how, um, how central uh, Torah is to life and life and life in its fullness. Um, but um, but one of the things that happens 
repeatedly in Psalm 119 is it's meditative. Um, right. So it's based on each different, um, as you know, as for each stanza is based on a particular letter of alpha, uh, um, Hebrew alphabet sequentially right the way through. Uh, and of course, the psalmist is repeatedly talking about his sin. Um, he talks about um, how, how he realizes that he is not able uh, to uh, live according to God's um, righteous decrees. So there's a lot of tension in that psalm as well as we come before the Lord um, <clears throat> um, with our own brokenness uh, and we seek what David is seeking in Psalm 19, which is to have our lives reintegrated, personally ordered in the way in which that God's mm -hmm. world, God's cosmos is ordered. Um, mm -hmm. so, so even if we just took that, that tells us that the application of rubric law in the public square is going to be a complex right. matter with all of those tensions. Uh, right. and we are not going to be able to move um, in any kind of facile or superficial way in our application unless it's the product of deep reflection and meditation. So right. that you have people who are um, steeped in problems of economy, political economy, steeped in issues about criminal justice or people traffic or whatever, to then relate it uh, to, uh, the, to the issues that we have in biblical texts uh, about slavery uh, and um, economy uh, and um, and crime and punishment and all this. My, my studies in biblical law started with prison reform, working for Michael Schluter. Um, right. And uh, and you kind of realise that there are no shortcuts here. So this goes back to my plea earlier on. Um, I, I believe that, it, that, that of course it's relevant um, because God's word is always relevant uh, because he is our, 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 our creator and, and, and our redeemer and he wants to restore things according to his uh, creative intent. Um, mm. uh, um, but um, uh, we... Um, you know, we're, we're, you know, we should be committed to excellence here. Um, and so we want to be making the best arguments that we can make in the public square. Um, and uh, we're not just going to be quoting scripture. You know, we're going to be making the best arguments that we can based on our in-depth knowledge uh, and active participation right. in the problems that we are engaged with, um, as you are in your cases. Um, combined with that engagement and deep meditation on the text. And, and what I was saying in the talk is that unless we are committed to getting wisdom from uh, scripture, mm. we are just going to be baptizing the less political theory or ideology. Uh, and, and, and that will be our, that will be our default. Um, mm. You yeah. know, it'll, it'll either be a wholly left wing view or it'll be a wholly right wing view. Um, but it's not necessarily going to be scriptural. Uh, yeah. And I think that um, if we are going to engage in this way, we have to offer the best. Yeah, um, okay. So, so reflection. Can, I, I mean, can I read, I mean, again, just to read this Go book, on. because, I mean, the, it's so rich. Be, go, uh, be good to your servant while I live, that I may obey your word. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Yes. I'm a stranger on earth, and I think sometimes it can feel like that, can it not? Do not hide your commands from me. This is the idea of the med meditation on God's law. My soul is consumed with longing for your laws at all times. You will rebuke the arrogant who are accursed, those who stray from your commands. Remove from me their scorn and contempt. Now, bear in mind that as we speak God's laws, um, then what we will often receive what, what we will often receive uh we might will be on the wrong end of contempt or we will we'll be on the right end of contempt as it were mm -hmm. but to keep yeah. on speaking it mm -hmm. uh, but 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 we're thrown back to studying god's laws uh the rulers sit the rulers sit together and slander me this is the tension that jonathan was talking about your what what's the response for god's people well the response is to meditate on God's law, to meditate mm. on God's decrees, because and in them uh, is delight, and the the the, the law is is that which counsels. And yeah. I think that you know, I, I and just imagine that if we as a church were saying, um, as this world is lost, um, as the government is lost, as things are in peril, we are going to actually in 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 and through all of this 
go back and really understand God's uh, what God's law um, says in relation to behavior, in relation to structure. Um, yeah. And as Jonathan said, not being consumed by the latest left wing or right so, wing or political ideology. Yeah. So, so Jonathan, listen, I'm conscious of time. So let's sort of close with this kind of question. Um, help us then, Jonathan. How do we apply biblical law? thousands of years old how do we apply it into the 21st century today obviously we, we should all read your book god justice and society which is very helpful on this but how else would you encourage us to go around about trying to apply old testament law would you want to point us to resources or principles or techniques how do we how do we go about it because we're in such a different culture now well i think um uh, we just have to go back to god's word um so i just really encourage everybody uh, to um, be reading the whole of the Torah during the course of the year. Um, observant Jews do it. They have the weekly parasha, the weekly Torah portion. They are used to reading Torah every single year from Genesis through to Deuteronomy. Um, so we should um, know uh, what, what it says. Um, get yourself a good study Bible. ESV study Bible is super. It's got lots of really good conceptual uh, information there. You don't, necessarily have to read all the monographs and the articles a lot of that's all served up for you um and i remember when i um started working uh for michael schluter um who kind of um uh set, set, helped to set set me up on, on the sort of odyssey or of, of, of thinking about um growing application um i think it was so you know basically it's about reading the bible um with um uh the day's paper sitting next to you um, or, or on your tablet or whatever and really when we do that and you know this i mean the issues just jump off the page don't they right really? um so so, so I, I think we have to um uh pray what you helpfully reminded us open my eyes that we will see wondrous things in in in, in your law we have to realize that um uh, the church is being led by the culture. The culture, very influenced by by uh, Marxist defen defenestration of the Bible and the place of the Bible in public life, uh, has sought to trash Torah uh, to make it yeah. seem poisonous. Um, but uh, we uh, want to turn that critique on itself and say, no, uh, it's not poisonous. It's glorious. Um, it reveals the majesty and the character of God. So open my eyes to see wonder wondrous things of God. Not to see problems, although that's not to say that we don't do challenges in engaging with problematic texts, but mm -hmm. we want to see uh, Jesus um, in all of his glory uh, as the fulfillment of Torah. We say that Torah is bad. What does that mean for our understanding of him? We want to see uh, Jesus in all of his glory as a fulfillment as a fulfillment of Torah. We want to see God's character as liberator. Uh, and uh, so we, we want to have our perceptions about scripture, about who God is, uh, changed. Um, and then we can then see uh, what the merits are, what vision is being given to us of uh, a holy and a happy and a well-ordered society. What does that look like? Uh, with all of these different facets um, integrated. Um, very helpful books like Jubilee Manifesto, uh, edited by uh, Michael Schluter, uh, which I think is still available. Um, and that sort of starts to, you know, and, and you know, and I think, you know, lots of people, um, I, I haven't been able to read uh, the comments coming in, but I know lots of people are engaging with these topics. Um, you know, as you have opportunity in your studies, uh, those yeah. of you who are students are uh, doing political science or history or English mm -hmm. or law. You can be studying all of these things. This is the bedrock of Western civilization. Um, and because it is the bedrock of Western civilization, you can't go very far without bumping into the scenery. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. um, so you can be bringing this, you can be doing dissertations on it, you can be doing research projects on it. If you're mm -hmm. doing masters, we, uh, many people are doing multiple masters. You bring this into your studies, bring it into your thinking. As you do that, you'll have opportunities to explore what does this mean in all of these different areas. Um, mm. I just work, I, I just do my bit. Um, but um, you know, this this is, you know, we live in a complex society. This involves across the board application. Um, but we work it out 
uh, in the fear of the Lord, um, believing that God is good, knowing that God is good, mm, mm, and we want mm. what is best for us and for our societies. Um, mm. That beginning, the middle and the end. Yeah, yeah. No, you're, you're absolutely right, Jonathan. And the Bible is so relevant on so many issues today that we face today and so many subjects. In fact, only the other day I was actually saying to somebody who's writing an essay on a political subject, well, you could also add that the Bible has this perspective on it. And he did. You know, um, and you know, that's the kind of thing that we need to do, isn't it, really, in this in this whole kind of area. And I must say as well, Jonathan, that you teach very, really brilliant talk, talks on our Wolf Force Academy. So do apply um, um, if you're a young graduate. Or, oh, yes. Or Come and spend graduate. a week with um, Jonathan Burns. Thank you, get, and me. Come and do it. <laughs> yeah. They get a real um, crash course in this whole area. Applications are open now. I think there's an early bird discount that ends uh, in the end of January. Um, but and I want to say that uh, something I want to pick up on there is that Jonathan, I mean, just just uh, challenged again. I love the way he always challenges um, because he says, I'm thinking about this. I'm studying this. So to to those of you that are studying out there that might be listening into this at whatever point you're listening into it, as you're developing your discipline of study, um, consider how you might bring in this this kind of this kind of study uh, on biblical law. Uh, and what it might, and actually, because we really need to see it, don't we, increasingly in the disc, in, in academic d discourse, what mm. light that would bring. So I hope mm. that, so I, I'm very much hoping that uh, our Wilberforce uh, dead And the Bible is relevant to, you know, English literature and Absolutely. legal studies, yes. of course, and historical studies and, you know, political science, all History, these things. History, law, you political know? science, anthropology. Yeah. Yeah, so all bring, it. It in. Yes. bring it in, bring it, it in, get in there. Yeah, fantastic stuff, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Um, really enjoyed it, especially the discussion at the end there. Very, very helpful stuff. We love working with you and having you with us, and we're looking forward to the next Wolf Force Academy as well. Um, so, and thank you for joining us. If you've been watching, I hope you enjoyed that and found it really helpful. Uh, we'll be back with our usual live stream on Friday lunchtimes, and uh, look forward to seeing you again then. Thank you very much. Good night.